Wow, that was a pretty cool episode, wasn't it? Shout out to all of you who were there during the watch party. Now, where do I begin in this breakdown? There was tons of stuff in this episode to discuss, and while we didn't see Ahsoka, there's a lot of buildup, not just for the next episode, but for all of Star Wars in general. We begin with Mando and Baby Yoda fixing the ship. Failing, really. They decide to visit Cara Dune and Grief Cargo on Navarro 7, the planet where all of Mando's adventures began in Season 1. Here, the Razor Crest will be fixed like new for his voyage to Corvus to find Ahsoka Tano. Now, I should mention during their flight to Navarro 7, Mando lifts his helmet to get some soup to his lips or drink. This to me shows progression that he might eventually open up to showing his face like Bo Katan, now that we know the Mandalorians have different beliefs amongst their different sects. The children of the Watch don't remove their helmets, whereas the rest do. Once landing on Navarro 7, Mando greets his old friends, to which this creature ominously looks back at them after being ordered to fix the ship like new. This creature is actually putting a homing beacon on the Mando's ship and being paid by Moff Gideon to do so. This is all going to be explained at the end of this breakdown, of course when we get to the end of the episode when it's revealed that this character was actually doing that. And we can kind of tell she's evil just by the snake noise that she makes when she looks back. As the crew walk through the village, we see a statue of an IG droid in the background, maybe IG-11's parts as homage from his sacrifice from Season 1. It should also be noted that Cara Dune is now a marshal of Navarro 7, taking out the thugs and bad guys of the planet like we saw in the beginning of the episode, with this little guy who actually breathes fire, that's why this guy's face is all melted. As they walk into a familiar looking place from season 1, we now see that it's been turned into a classroom for children, being taught about planets and star systems by a protocol droid just like C-3PO. As Din puts the child down in the class to go off to a new mission that they're about to embark on, Baby Yoda watches a boy eating a macaroon next to him, until he finally uses the force to steal them and eat them for himself. Mando follows his friends to the mission at hand. They meet with the Mithral from Episode 1 Season 1, who kinda sounds like he's talking to the authorities, like he's about to give up Din Djarin by saying the Razor Crest has no registration, but he thinks it belongs to, to which he's cut off, as Mando and the crew walk in. The Mithril is doing community service and serving his sentence of 350 years for his original arrest. He tells Mando that he doesn't want to be frozen in carbonite again, as his eye is still blind from it. This is kind of a reference to the effects of carbonite freezing, to which we first saw Han Solo suffer from in Return of the Jedi, where his eyesight didn't return for hours after his release by Leia in Jabba's palace. He is briefed on basically an Imperial outpost. There are tons of military guns and vehicles being housed there, and the crew fear that the black market could get their hands on it and cause trouble for the planet. As they head over to the outpost, it reminds me a lot of Kejim from JK2. Basically, Kyle Katarn goes to Kejim Outpost to discover that it's very much occupied and being used to perform experiments for injecting the Force basically into organic beings who didn't have any Force abilities. If you played Jedi Knight Jedi Outcast 2, which I'm going to replay on the channel in live streams, then you'll get this reference. Or you'll get this backstory that was from Legends. When they get to the base, they realize that it's not empty at all. They take out some stormtroopers on the exterior, and then they go inside, carefully. As they find the reactor, they set it to blow up, where they have 10 minutes to evacuate. Things are moving pretty quickly at this point. They go through some corridors to find some men in uniform at a computer sporting badges that look similar to the cloning symbol that cloners wear. Although I gotta say there is a bit of a discrepancy here, but they're probably just cloners. The men destroy the evidence on screen and die in blaster fire, whereas Mando, Grief, Kara, and the Mithril find out what is really going on here. Life forms in tubes floating. As we sort of zoom in on this one subject, we can hear Snoke's theme playing in the background. The subject looks just like Snoke. Now, all of these beings have something wrong with them. They just don't look like they've really evolved properly or grown properly. Now, this one even here, with me brightening the image, you can see it has the same head scar and broken looking body as Snoke. The shoulders are the same, so is the torso. It seems whatever they're doing here didn't work. Maybe they're trying to clone Snoke, maybe they're trying to create Snoke, maybe they're trying to clone Palpatine with splicing genes. In the Episode 9 novel, it was written that the Empire was splicing genes in order to create some vessel for Palpatine 
to operate. As Dr. Pershing's hologram shows up in a recorded message to Moff Gideon from three days ago, he informs the Moff, and I quote, replicated the results of the subsequent trials which also resulted in catastrophic failure. There were promising effects for an entire fortnight, but sadly, the body rejected the blood. I highly doubt we'll find a donor with a higher M count though. I recommend that we suspend all experimentation. I fear that the volunteer will meet the same regrettable fate if we proceed with the transfusion. Unfortunately, we have exhausted our initial supply of blood. The child is small and I was only able to harvest a limited amount without killing him. If these experiments are to continue as requested, we would again require access to the donor. So essentially what this means is that they're doing what they did in the prequels with sifo to Grievous. They took Jedi Master sifo blood and tried to do a blood transfusion with it to General Grievous to make him force sensitive. It did nothing. Then in the game Force Unleashed 2, Vader's secret apprentice who was killed was later cloned hundreds of times and cloning a force sensitive being yields extreme failure with maybe 1% chance of it working. And even if the host doesn't die, they almost always suffer from some sort of defect, psychological problems, physical, or they're just not force sensitives. Kind of like Palpatine's son or his clone in The Rise of Skywalker, or in other words, Rey's father. Dr. Pershing says that all their trials failed miserably. So their attempts to put force sensitive blood from Baby Yoda into cloned bodies didn't work. Now, Dr. Pershing is a doctor for the cloning facility as indicated by the badge on his lab uniform. He says that the body rejected the blood and that they'll likely find a donor with a higher M count. Now, what's an M count? Well, it stands for midichlorian count, I assume. Qui-Gon Jinn made this term known to us the first time in The Phantom Menace when he measured Anakin's midichlorians by taking a sample of his blood and sending it to Obi-Wan for analysis. Learning that Anakin's midichlorian count was over 20,000, which was more than Master Yoda's. Now, this doesn't mean necessarily that he was more powerful than Yoda while he was just nine years old, but it means his potential, even at this age, is more than Master Yoda's, which is just a testament to show that he was the chosen one and how powerful he could have really become had he not lost to his own arrogance to Obi-Wan Kenobi. Dr. Pershing wants to stop all tests because he fears the volunteer will die if they try it on him or her. Now who the volunteer is, I can only guess is a clone of Palpatine, maybe the best or the last one of him that they have. Perhaps it's Snoke, perhaps it's a clone of Luke, or perhaps it's the Shadow Troopers. Now the donor, I believe, is Baby Yoda, the child, while the volunteer could be really anybody, could even be Moff Gideon, who's trying to get force sensitive himself. This also confirms that he's not force sensitive since if he was, he'd probably just use his own blood. Now these that he's looking at, we're gonna jump a little bit back and forth, if I'm correct, are shadow troopers. These are force sensitive stormtroopers basically, and they're pretty cool. They were made force sensitive by injecting them with force sensitive blood. Oh, and they also had red lightsabers. Imagine all these guys fighting Ahsoka. Now they could also be using this for Snoke, Palpatine's clone, Moff Gideon, or as I mentioned, Luke Skywalker from the hand that fell in Empire Strikes Back. Stormtroopers show up, Din decides to jetpack out of there to get to the city and get the child since Moff Gideon is still alive, while Kara, Grief, and Mithril blast their way out of there, eventually hijacking a Trexler Marauder much like the troop transport repulsor craft Moff Gideon used in Season 1. The crew escape while shooting down the scout troopers following them, which was a pretty funny scene when a few of them died because of their poor flying maneuvers. Grief sits in the back, shoots down the scout troopers, Kara smashes one into the rocks, and all is well, until the TIE Fighters take off and give them a hard time. When Mando flies in with his Razor Crest in an amazing dogfight in the sky against two TIEs, it was really a big action highlight of the episode and shows you how Star Wars is absolutely always the top dog in dogfights. Mando wins, the heroes win, and Baby Yoda pukes up his blue macaroons that he indulged on. As the show nears its end, we see Captain Teva, the same captain of the New Republic that we saw with Dave Filoni's character, Trapper Wolf. He's questioning Grief Karga on what happened here, and that he worries about the odd activity of the remnants of the Empire, that the core worlds don't know much about what is happening, but they feel something is happening in the background that they are not aware of something bad. We also get more backstory, slightly on Cara Dune, as her and the captain talk about how she lost everyone on her home planet of Alderaan when the Death Star blew it up. Now I have a feeling that she's related to someone that we may know from the originals. Maybe she's Bail Organa's blood-related daughter, 
Leia's stepsister, who knows, or cousin twice removed. The next scene shows the Arquitans class light cruiser flying above us in all of its glory, as we see an Imperial officer dressed in some sort of Empire First Order hybrid style uniform as she speaks to the same alien that was working on the Razor Crest, saying the device has been planted. The officer replies with, you will be rewarded in the new era. And I took that as meaning the First Order. So I think the Mandalorian show will be transitioning into the First Order from the Empire, and we get to see how that all took place. As she goes to Moff Gideon, she informs him that the Razor Crest is now being tracked and that the asset is on board. As he smirks in certain victory of what's to come, she leaves as we see the Moff observing what looks like shadow troopers, maybe 20 or so of them. Either that or their dark troopers, which were really crazy advanced battle droids. They kind of don't seem to be alive, so I'm just wondering, maybe they're requiring some activation of some sorts, maybe they're droids, maybe they need the force sensitive blood to come alive, I don't really know. But if we're following down the lines of legends with Jedi Knight 2 and Kal Katarn, then maybe, just maybe, these are shadow troopers waiting to be unleashed on the Mando who will soon enough be with Ahsoka Tano, whose location is all being tracked by Moff Gideon. Imagine her fighting against him or all of these guys with red lightsabers against her white ones. How cool would that be? I can't wait to see the next episode. I think it's gonna be probably the most intense one yet. And as for Boba, I'm still hopeful that we're gonna see him once again. Have an awesome rest of your day. Thanks for joining this video, the watch party, and your overall support. I love you guys so much. This is an awesome community, and I'm so happy to be part of it with you. I'll see you in the next episode. Until then, remember, the Force will be with you, always.